Hello everyone, welcome to Nova Southeastern University's Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. This podcast is made to encourage, enhance, and promote all those amazing health professionals working with people with chronic health diseases, their caregivers, and support systems. In today's episode, we are taking an in-depth look at the Mediterranean diet and its role in the prevention of chronic diseases with our subject matter expert, Melinda Lewis. Melinda Lewis is a registered dietitian in the Department of Nutrition at NSU. She has many years of experience working with patients and clients to improve overall health through the power of food. She has worked in many settings as a clinical dietitian. Also, she has worked in the community with older adults, educating them on healthy diets and cooking tips. Hello, Melinda. Hello, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Can we start by you telling us why this topic is important to you? Absolutely. Um, I've really always enjoyed working with the senior groups in practice, um, whether it's in clinical practice or in the community. And on a personal level, I've really appreciated um, nutrition in regards to working with my family members and providing meals for them. Um, What's really interesting, I think, about this particular topic regarding the Mediterranean diet is that when we talk about food, we don't often connect that with the medical recommendations or treatments. And really when we look at what the diet, Mediterranean diet is about, it's really designed to work along with treatment uh, for diseases such as heart disease and diabetes. Um, One thing that is really becoming more popular that we're hearing about is food as medicine. And what that means is that there's food that have special nutrient qualities to them that really have played a role in preventing chronic diseases as well as some treatment. And also even um, with dementia, improving memory. Um, As a dietitian, I really do believe that we can prevent these diseases and with food as medicine, actually be a part of the treatment for chronic diseases. Fantastic, thank you. For the podcast audience, can you share what families and caregivers need to know about the Mediterranean diet? Yes, um, I think that for me, the Mediterranean diet is really more of a a way of incorporating foods that have health benefits as way more than just a diet. Um, And those benefits can help support brain health as well as heart health. Um, I think the best thing to think about um, in terms of what the overall qualities of the Mediterranean diet are is one, that it does have some ability to help maintain and even sometimes boost our immune system, which will help keep us healthy. Um, Also, just improve overall health status uh, and as well as disease prevention. What exactly is the Mediterranean diet? Well, that's a great question. I think um, there are a lot of different perceptions about what the Mediterranean diet is. And it's it's actually interesting, the origin of the Mediterranean diet. It's, it's based on diets of people who live at the, in the Mediterranean Sea area. Um, and a lot of background research that was done with older individuals in Greece. And in a particular area, there are a lot of older adults who have lived well in their t- into their 90s and have very few medical conditions. So it's more about a way of life and eating foods that really include rich nutrients. Um, Some of those nutrients like vitamins and minerals have really been shown to have benefits with reducing blood pressure. Um, Potassium is potassium is one of those, for example. Um, The diet is also very low in sodium. And most of us have heard something about how sodium is not great to have a whole lot of in the diet, especially if you have high blood pressure um, or some other disease that that is related to heart health. Um, Whereas potassium, which is very high in the Mediterranean diet, uh, can actually help reduce high blood pressure. So foods that contain some of these nutrients um, are gonna be helpful to have in in the meal plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about what some of those foods are in a little bit. I think that that will be helpful. Is there any existing research on Mediterranean diet and its impact on managing specific chronic disease, for example, diabetes or hypertension? Absolutely. There's so much research out there. Um, There is one 
particular article that uh, was done with a very large population of Greek individuals. And that, that study was pretty much a landmark study when we think about where do we get the data to, to say that this Mediterranean diet can really impact health and prevent disease. And this study was uh, incorporated a, a population of individuals in Greece, um, 22,000 adults, which is great for a study. Uh, and what they looked at over 44 months was that how many of those individuals in the study um, either uh, you know, did not do well in a health, from a health perspective, um, even though they were maintaining the, the Mediterranean diet. But there was a very small percentage of 22,000 people. There was only 275 adverse outcomes. Um, that's pretty impressive. And what they really were able to attribute that to was an, a really strong um, adherence to the traditional Medi Mediterranean diet um, and that it is associated with actually longer mortality. So that's pretty cool. That, so that's one. Um, but we also think about uh, what about disease process, um, diabetes and, and heart disease. And another study that really looked at a variety, many different um, articles. It was a, re a review article, rather, on the Mediterranean diet and its benefits with the prevention of type 2 diabetes, as well as the progression of the disease. So this study found out, ultimately, um, through incorporating these in, uh, particular nutrients that exist in the Mediterranean diet, that they saw a great improvement in uh, managing type 2 diabetes, as well as some other benefits like um, anti-inflammatory properties and uh, also even changes in, in the gut, um, what we call gut microbiota, which is really our healthy intestine and, and, and um, gastrointestinal tract. So it's pretty cool. Um, and so that was another study that I thought was it really stood out in terms of the value, in terms of recommendations regarding the Mediterranean diet. Great, thank you. And just getting into a little bit more detail, what foods are typically a part of the Mediterranean diet? That's awesome because it really incorporates a great variety of foods. Many of the diets that are out there today tend to emphasize only one or two foods and then really de-emphasize other foods. But that's the best part about the Mediterranean diet. It really incorporates a variety of foods, uh, including fruits and uh, vegetables, breads, um, even potatoes, nuts, beans, seeds, all of these are really high in fiber and they're also very high in potassium, which we mentioned before. Um, so you can add these foods into your meal plan. Typically we want to say yes, fresh meals are best in terms of the foods. Um, and but I'll mention, uh, talk a little bit more about that later in terms of how do we really work that into the meal plan. But we also do know that there's a, a guideline for how many servings from each of the food groups that we might want to incorporate. So we look at about two to three servings of fruit and vegetables a day, and, and that might sound like a lot, but a, just a half a cup of fruit, which is a pretty small portion. Um, the whole fruit is better than juice uh, and in terms of its overall um, nutrient benefit. Um, dried fruit is another option, and we do see that in the Mediterranean diet. Uh, the use of dried fruits mixed in with rice and, and other um, protein-rich foods to add a different layer of flavor and interest as well as the nutrients that, they, that um, provide those benefits. A half a cup of cooked vegetables is only one serving. So it's easy really to get those, those uh, portions. And things like broccoli and cauliflower, um, those are great vegetable choices and easy to prepare. And also one of the things that I think is really helpful, especially in our culture today, which is using fruits as desserts, as opposed to going for some of the more, you know, the cakes and the, the ice creams and those sort of things to really kind of come back to using that sweet as, as the dessert item and from a more natural perspective. Um, beans and lentils are really great sources, again, of potassium and fiber. Um, they're, they really recommend in the Mediterranean diet about three servings per week, which is 
not that much really. Garbanzo beans or other beans, I don't know if you, um, some people like lentils, which is a great, another great um, source of um, fiber. Um, also canned beans are inexpensive and you know we talk a lot about canned foods and maybe they're not the best option but it, they're always better over nothing. Um, additionally if you're concerned about sodium because canned foods tend to be high in sodium um, you can rinse those off and it really does take out a lot of the sodium and, and they're very um, affordable and uh, hummus is a very popular snack now um, just pureed chickpeas with some garlic and very easy to prepare. Also whole grains such as whole wheat bread, um, other breads that are multi-grains, and also incorporating some starchy veggies like uh, potatoes or corn. Those are great source of fiber as well. Now some people are also <clears throat> concerned about what are the oils, like how much fat should I add, what are the best oils, and what we've seen in the Mediterranean diet that have health benefits are things like olive oil um, that is used as a primary oil source in the Mediterranean diet. And it's really um, a great opportunity to use an oil in terms of salad dressings, uh, substitute oil in other recipes. Um, olive oil is a great option. And the dairy products are limited on the Mediterranean diet, but mostly towards uh, yogurt and some cheeses. Uh, fish is especially a, a food that's emphasized on this meal plan. Red meat is really much smaller portions, much less frequently. Um, and uh, smaller portions of your protein-rich foods. And um, also really limiting processed foods. We do live in a society where there's so many processed foods out there. And, and so, again, fresh is best in that regard. But uh, there are also some other ways that you can incorporate foods um, into the meal plan that might not be the fresh foods, but canned or, or frozen. Um, and we can talk about that in a moment. And also, one of the other things that has been very controversial is wine or alcohol. Um, certainly, for those, of, for those individuals who have health uh, concerns or taking medication that wine is contraindicated with or you shouldn't drink, uh, wine with a certain medication, that's a different story. <laughs> but if that's okay uh, and, and approved by your medical <laughs> professionals, um, wine is, is a part of the meal plan uh, in, in that regards. And about three and a half ounces a day for women uh, and about two servings of that for men and with meals only. But obviously it's optional. <laughs> Great, thank you. At times it's hard for people who live alone or only cooking for one or two people to buy and eat a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. What can they do to eat the foods on the diet? Right, and as I alluded to before, um, there's a lot of other options. It, frozen fruits uh, actually at times and vegetables, uh, frozen vegetables at times can be, have more nutrients than the ones that are sitting in the grocery store for several days. Um, because they do freeze them as at the top freshness or ripeness. So frozen fruits and veg veggies are good. If you're only, uh, you know, if you're preparing small portions or small portions with, for your family or for yourself, they're easy to prepare. They can be heated up in small portions and microwave or even on the stove top. They tend to be more cost effective um, because you're certainly not wasting it as much as you might if it's a, a fresh food. And oftentimes they're inexpensive. And you can hold them for a long period of time. There are some, some other options that can make meal preparation a little bit better for individuals who are only cooking for themselves or for a few people. Um, some of the grocery stores have fully cooked chicken that can, is easy to warm up, so it does help with uh, meal preparation. And um, even mix of vegetables, which is uh, good. And, and you can certainly find all of those that are consistent with the, with the Mediterranean diet that are part of that diet. Uh, with the real emphasis is incorporating fruits and vegetables. Um, the typical American diet is very low in fresh fruits and vegetables, or fresh fruits and, or veggies and fruits, period, whether they're frozen or canned or fresh. So really 
just focusing on increasing those food groups comes uh, is is a more consistent with the Mediterranean diet. I know you alluded to it um, with the canned foods, but um, a lot of older people find frozen meals easy to prepare in small portions, but I've heard they're high in sodium as well. Um, so what are some good options? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I So many patients that I've worked with, and again, family members who really don't want to cook anymore. They're just tired of it. They don't want to be bothered with it. So frozen meals are a great, oppor- you know, a great option for them because it does make things easier. But it is challenging because they do tend to be higher in sodium, higher in fat, because those two, uh, those two ingredients really make the flavor uh, stronger. So it seems that you know, those, those meals are high. But there are some brands, like um, I'm not promoting any particular brand, but a couple brands that I, put, I know about which is Amy's brand um, and Healthy Choice, tend to be lower in sodium. Um, a frozen meal less than 500, milli- 500 milligrams or less is, is typically a good choice. Uh, I know also that some of the meals that have sauces in them tend to be higher in sodium and fat. So looking for maybe just an entree that has a fresh, fr- then, and then adding a fr- um, sorry, fresh fruit or vegetable with it, um, or heating up some vegetables that you might have, a slice of whole grain bread or some brown rice with it. You can definitely get a full meal that way that is consistent with the Mediterranean diet. Um, And the good thing is, is even with brown rice, which sometimes takes a little more time to cook, you can still find that uh, in in microwavable um, small portions on the shelves as well. Sounds great. Are there any reasons why someone should not begin a Mediterranean diet? Well, the one thing that is true that any time you make a a dietary change, um, you do want to check with your doctor before just to make sure that there's no reason why um, you shouldn't be making that change. There are some core foods that some people can't include, maybe due to medication, um, uh, medication concerns that there might be an interaction there. Um, If there are certain diseases that you might have to limit certain nutrients like potassium, um, sometimes with diverticular disease, avoiding nuts and seeds is a very common recommendation, but they are a core part of the Mediterranean diet. And of course, as I mentioned before, um, drinking alcohol. Um, Definitely need to check with your physician about that prior to adding that into a meal plan. Also, um, you know, the diet can be modified by substituting some of these restricted foods with other choices. So it can still follow the Mediterranean guidelines. It's just a matter of knowing what foods to substitute um, in order to maintain the diet itself, but also to keep that healthy element of, of the meal plan going. So I do have to say that as a dietitian, we work with patients all the time in order to do that, especially if there are other disease complications going on, we wanna make sure that you're still able to meet those dietary principles of the diet, and yet within a safe um, guideline for yourself. Do you have any other suggestions for families and caregivers regarding the Mediterranean diet? Well, the prevention of any chronic disease is complicated, and it really isn't just about diet. Um, An overall healthy lifestyle that would include some kind of physical activity. And it doesn't mean you have to go jogging or go work out in a gym. It can be just some light physical activity around the house if there's some limitations in mobility. Um, Some other, what any other healthy lifestyle activities, maybe you enjoy gardening. Um, Those are activities that are important to include. Uh, And also think about just making small dietary changes a little bit at a time. Oftentimes, when we try to make change our whole meal plan in a short period of time, and that makes it very difficult, and sometimes we don't end up following through with that. So just small dietary changes uh, in, in the beginning. Great. If you had one magic wish to make about the Mediterranean diet in terms of research, clinical care, education, what would it be? I love that question, Kim. That's great. Um, I think I'd like to see more research that shows 
that really following this meal plan will prevent those diseases um, and really have really reinforce that idea of food as medicine. And even though we do have a lot of research out there, there's always more that's needed. Um, and definitely to help those who do have chronic diseases because you know of what they're eating um, and certainly help them feel better and have a better quality of life. So that's my wish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lastly, what are the, um, where can the audience find more resource, resources about this topic? That's a great question. There are so many uh, resources out there. Um, if we think about the American Alzheimer's Disease uh, Association, um, eatright.org is the Academy of the Nutrition and Dietetics um, profession, and they have a lot of resources for families, for um, seniors. Also, the American Heart Association has a lot of information about the Mediterranean diet. Cleveland Clinic's website also has some great information. And of course, I have to say, um, talking to your healthcare provider and your registered dietitian in order to develop meal plans that, that are specific for you. Melinda Lewis, thank you for joining us today. You're so welcome, Kim. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Of course. And please stay tuned for upcoming topics from our renowned subject matter experts. As a reminder, this podcast is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as part of an award. The contents are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily represent the official views of nor an endorsement by HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government.